Hi, welcome back to The Wandering Wesleyan. I'm Chaplain Greg, and uh, I'm so happy and honored that you're watching my video. Um, if you like the content that you're receiving here, please like this video, subscribe, and hit that post notification bell so you can be notified when I am releasing new content. So, we've been talking a lot about the Bible, and we've been talking about translations of the Bible, and uh, this is the third video in the introduction to the series, Walking in the Word. And uh, we're going to finish the introduction and then do a deep dive into Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And I'll talk about why we're doing a deep dive for those three chapters and doing high-level overviews for most of the rest of the Bible uh, when we get there. But let's continue on with our introduction. So we talked a lot about translations. So now that we've picked out the translation that we like to read, that is the best translation for us to understand the Bible, and uh, we're going to be looking at different genres within the Bible. Different genres. So what is a genre? So a genre is a category. Um, you, when you think of music, there's all different types of music, genres of music. You have jazz and blues and progressive rock. Those are my three favorite kinds of music. You have classical music. You have heavy metal. Um, even within classical music, there's subgenres. There's Baroque and there's, uh, you know, contemporary classical music. There is uh, uh, different kinds of genres, subgenres within genres. So you listen to music differently depending on its genre. So if I'm listening to an album by, um, or a live concert, let's say, by the Grateful Dead, well, that's going to be a different kind of listening than if I'm listening to Handel's Messiah. I'm doing, I'm listening to it differently. I'm looking for different things. And that really works with literature as well. So within the Bible, there's different kinds of genres. Each genre of, um, of the Bible needs to be read in its own way. So books can have multiple genres, even within themselves. So you think of Daniel. Daniel, up until cha uh, through chapter 6, is storytelling, history. And then you get into chapter 7, and it's this deeply prophetic kind of writing. And so you're going to read it differently than you are the history. Um, there are different types of genres within the Bible, of as I said. The first one I learned from uh, Dr. William Lane Craig, who is a brilliant apologist, very, very smart guy. And uh, he wrote a book on the, uh, the existence of the uh, historical Adam. And uh, he calls the first three chapters of Genesis and other parts of the Bible mytho-history. Mm, interesting. So what is mytho-history? Myth. Now, we think of myths as something we disprove, wives' tales, things that we uh, try to see if they're just made up. Um, that's not what myth is in the liter literary sense. As far as mythical literature goes, mythical literature is a story that can use um, characters to do amazing and fantastic things that it usually tells a point. I think uh, The Lord of the Rings is great mythology. Um, you, you think of the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer. Great mythology. Um, all of it tells a grand story to make larger points. And mytho-history uses historical figures to make these significant points. You use mytho-history to make a significant point within a larger story. And so you're going to read that a little bit differently. And when we get into Genesis, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, what other types of genres within the Bible? There's poetry, uh, the Psalms, uh, even within. So the first chapter of Luke has two significant poems in there. Uh, it has the Magnificat, Mary's Magnificat, and uh, Zechariah's song. Um, Two beautiful pieces of poetry. Uh, like I said, the Psalms has poetry. Moses, within the Torah, has several different uh, Psalms and poems that he puts in there. So, so you're going to read that a little bit differently. Um, 
think of it this way. A poem tries to say an awful lot with a few words. So you can read a poem and you can ponder it and, and reread it and get something more out of it. And it's got fewer words. So a poem says a lot with few words, whereas a newspaper article has a lot of words and usually says very little. So that's the difference between a poem and other forms of uh, other genres is that it uses fewer words, but they're deeper, they're symbolic, they're, 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 they call to be re read and reread over again. Uh, another genre, historical narrative, that's something that we're pretty familiar with. So uh, most of the Gospels is historical narrative. Uh, you think of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah as being historical kind of books telling history of what happened. Uh, you have wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job. You have prophetic books, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, the Minor Prophets, uh, and Revelation. That's that's its own special character right there. Uh, that is not only prophetic genre, but it's also apocalyptic genre. And uh, way down the line when we get to Revelation, we'll talk about what apocalyptic literature is. It's a specific kind of literature in the ancient world uh, that had a very specific purpose. And when we get to Revelation at the end of the series, way down the line, we'll, we'll dive into that. Um, biography, the, the Gospels, they're, they're biographies. Acts is a series of smaller biographies of people and what they did and how they, uh, and how they acted under certain circumstances. Uh, letters, Paul's letters, Paul's letters to the Romans, Paul's letters to uh, Timothy and, and Thessalonica, all the all the letters that he wrote. Uh, you're going to read letters a little bit differently, and you're going to see different things because letters uh, tend to be a little bit more personal um, than maybe a historical book is going to be. And then you have sermons. So there's two classic sermons within the New Testament. Um, the book of Hebrews and 1st John are, are two excellent examples of sermons. So you have this collection of books with different genres. And as you're reading through it, you're constantly, as you're reading through the Bible, you're constantly shifting how you are reading that Bible. Now, I mentioned last time when we were talking about uh, choosing a Bible to read when you're reading through um, that I wasn't a fan of starting with study Bibles, even though I'm a huge fan of study Bibles, love study Bibles. The reason for that is because what we want to do is see the Bible for what it is and do inductive exegesis. Oh, those are big words, aren't they? We don't want to do, here's two more big words, deductive eisegesis. What does that mean? Let's start with deductive eisegesis. So deductive means you start with a theory and then you find evidence for that theory. And so this is something that is frequently done uh, with, with the scientific method, that you start with a hypothesis, and then you go to find evidence for or against that hypothesis. Um, so deductive reasoning is you start with a theory and you find evidence for that theory that either confirms or, or rejects that theory. Eisegesis means that you read into something, iso, you read into, so you bring your presuppositions into what you're reading. When it comes to Bible study and reading the Bible, we don't want to do deductive eisegesis. We don't want to read into the Bible, you know, something that we think is true. We want to take out of the Bible what is true. So an example of eisegesis is that if we wanted to say that uh, polygamy is a legitimate form of marriage, we can say, well, the Bible says that, Dan that David had many wives and Jesus said, go and do likewise. 
right? It's in the Bible, right? Well, that's eisegesis. That's taking things out of context in order to prove your theory. And uh, it, it doesn't fly. It's, it's not a good way of determining truth within literature. It's a good way to determine truth in other circumstances, but not when reading the Bible. Um, what we want to do is inductive exegesis. So exegesis, let's start there, means that we're taking out from the Bible, we're taking out from what we're reading, what it says. We're not trying to read something into it. We're taking out exit, exegesis, taking out from it what the Bible says. And we're going to do inductive study. What does that mean? That means that we are going to observe, we're going to interpret, and then we're going to apply. So the first thing we do is observe. We, we take a passage of scripture and we answer the questions, who, who is it written to? Who is the person in this passage of scripture? Uh, where, where was the letter delivered? Uh, where were these characters um, in activity in the passage of scripture? What, what was going on? What were the things that, you know, we're, we're, we're doing this observation work so that we can understand what the Bible is telling us. When we have those observations put together, then we can start to interpret. See, if we start with interpreting, we may miss something. When we start with observation and try and get as many facts and as many parts out of the passage as we can, then we can have a better understanding and a better approach to interpreting. Interpretation is now you can pull out your study Bible. You've done all your observation. You've taken the plain text. Okay, this is not a study Bible. This is a Bible that just has plain text. You've looked at the plain text. You've observed everything you can out of it. And now you try to interpret what does it all mean? And after you get done making an interpretation and you're looking at your study Bibles, you're looking at your uh, commentaries and your Bible dictionaries and all that kind of thing. Bible dictionaries are actually good for observation too. Seeing what a particular word means, what the original um, Greek or Hebrew, how they approach that word. So that, may, that could be under observation as well. But when you're interpreting, you're using all of those Bible tools, such as commentaries and, and study Bibles and, and that, that sort of thing. And then you apply it. What does this mean to you? What are the, how does that affect your life? What does it tell you about God? What is God trying to tell you about yourself? What is God trying to tell you about things that you're doing or things that you're thinking about doing? Um, application is an important part of Bible study. Now, I want to finish our, our time today with talking about some recurring themes that are in the Bible. Um, as we are observing and reading the Bible, and we're reading the genres in uh, the way that they're supposed to be read, we're going to notice some returning themes happening over and over again. Um, and these are just a few of them. Exile and return. The whole Bible is about exile and return, where our first parents in the garden were exiled from the garden, and God is seeking to return us back to his presence. Um, Moses, and the, the ex, his, he was exiled from his community in Egypt, and he returned to that. And Israel was exiled from the promised land in Egypt, and return to it. Um, Israel was exiled from its land to Babylon and returned. Exile and return is all over the Bible. Uh, another recurring theme, and this is very, this is almost exclusively to the Old Testament, and that's the angel of the Lord, this character that pops up all over the place. The angel of the Lord is uh, what we call a Christophany, uh, an appearance what Christians believe is an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. So wherever you see the angel of the Lord, it's interesting because he's a human-like figure that speaks like he's God. 
who, who could that be? Christians say that's Jesus. Another recurring theme, light and dark. Um, light, lightness and darkness is all over the place in the Bible. Uh, First John is an excellent example of that, where he talks about in um, the second part, or the first part of that sermon about the gospel of light. Uh, lightness and darkness is an important part of Jewish celebration and an important part of the Psalms. So you'll see light and dark constantly in there. Uh, sin and grace is another recurring theme that you'll see over and over again. So look for themes. Um, one of the things that I do in my annual Bible reading is I will take a couple of themes and I will look for them. You can't see all of them all the time. That's why the Bible is a book that is read and reread and you're constantly getting new things out of it. Um, for example, this year, I looked at a couple of different themes. Uh, I looked at the themes of blessing. What does blessing mean? Uh, I also looked at the theme of clean versus unclean. What does that mean within the Bible? And when we get into the Torah and talk specifically about Leviticus, we'll, we'll talk about this idea of clean and unclean. Um, all of this leads you to picking up this book and reading it and getting done at the end of the year. I usually take a year to read through it and saying, wow. I miss so much, I need to go back and do it again. And I've been doing it for many years now. Um, little story before I go. I was an elder at a church uh, many years ago. And one of the women in the church uh, came up to me and said, So, Elder Greg, when are you starting your Bible reading for the year? And I was challenged because she had been reading her Bible through every year for many, many years. And I hadn't done that. And I said, well, January 1st, I'm picking it up. And I found a Bible reading plan and I've been doing it ever since. And it, it was hard at first. Here's the thing. A lot of times when you get with plans, you feel and, and you fall behind. You feel like you got a race to catch up. If you start reading the Bible in January, nothing says you have to finish December 31st. Go into March. If you miss a few days, eh, so what? Get caught up. Keep reading along. Keep doing it. Um, there's a lot of different uh, plans out there. The one-year Bible plan is great because you can read a little bit of Old Testament uh, you read a psalm or a portion of a psalm. Uh, you read a proverb and then you read some New Testament. And that way you get you get a bunch of... You, you're not stuck in one genre. We talked about genres, right? So you're not stuck in one thing. And you're getting a little bit of variety in your reading. Uh, the one-year Bible is great. Uh, after you've read through the Bible a few times, the chronological Bible is really interesting. Where do so the Bible is not laid out chronologically, it's laid out according to theme. So, and we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to talk about how the Bible is laid out. Um, but find a plan that works for you. Like this year, what I did was I did one year Old Testament, one year New Testament, did them together. Um, Next year, I think I'm going to go to the one-year Bible plan. I have a uh, study Bible mm -hmm. uh, called the Ancient Faith Study Bible, which uh, puts in the writings of the of the Church Fathers with uh, the text. And I'm really looking forward to that. So we're running up on 20 minutes, so I want to uh, let you go. But uh, thank you so much for watching. Any questions or comments, feel free to put it in the comments section, whether you're uh, watching this on my blog or you're watching it on YouTube. Uh, please, again, I appreciate it if you would like and subscribe and hit that post notification. And I will see you all next week. Thanks and God bless.